Welcome back to Students Teach Orgo. We're going to continue the unit on organometallic chemistry by discussing coupling reactions in today's video. Uh, there's going to be three coupling reactions we talk about, and all three of them use a palladium catalyst, uh, which makes it a little bit confusing, but I'm going to try to explain how you should be able to determine which of the three reactions it is uh, purely based on the reactants. So the first reaction we're going to talk about is the Heck reaction, and this should be familiar to those of you who watched the last video. Um, in the last video, we used the entire Heck reaction to demonstrate the different types of fundamental reactions of metal complexes. So for organic chemistry too, you don't need to memorize this whole cycle, but you will need to know this information. You need to know that in the Heck reaction, we use an aryl or vinyl halide and an activated alkene. And these two pieces will become coupled in the reaction. Uh, so to start off, an aryl or vinyl halide, what does that look like? You can see down here we have a good example of a vinyl halide. And a vinyl halide is just any halide that's attached to a double bond here. An example of an aryl halide would be if we had a bromine sticking off of benzene. And so in order to do these metal coupling reactions, it's really important that the halide um, or triflate being used is either vinyl or this is aryl. Um, and so I talk about triflates here. What's a triflate? Well, a triflate would look something like this, this OTF compound. And as you can see again here, this OTF is vinyl because it's connected to this carbon, which um, is doubly bonded. Um, and so we also need an alkene. And you can see in both of the examples I have down here, there's an alkene. And over here, this is an alkene. So that's a really important part of this reaction. Um, I mentioned here that it needs to be in the presence of a base. So right here is an example of the reagents you might see um, that denote that a heck reaction is going on. And so you can see really importantly is the palladium catalyst and this triethylamine is the base. Um, but if you ever see these reactants, that's another hint that we're going to be doing the heck reaction. So what actually happens is uh, what we discussed in the last video, but the shortcut that you can take is you can kind of imagine that we just kind of lose the bromine and we make a bond from where the bromine was to the alkene. And you can see that coupling comes together to give us a product that looks like this. And you can see the same thing happens over here. We can kind of imagine the triflate goes away and we're just making a bond between this carbon and that carbon right there to give us this compound. Now, another thing that's worth noting is this double bond right here is the E stereoisomer. And the E stereoisomer is going to be the more common product in this reaction. Um, sometimes students will also call it the, the trans double bonds. I think E is technically more correct, but the E or trans double bonds um, will be the more abundant product after this coupling. Uh, the next coupling reaction we're going to look at is the Suzuki reaction. And so you can see the reagents for the Suzuki reaction are a little bit different. We still have the palladium catalyst, but it's really important anytime you see ethoxide, we know that it's going to be the Suzuki reaction. Um, and the Suzuki reaction also uses different reactants. Uh, we can see that we still have the aryl or vinyl halide or triflate. That's the same as before. But with Suzuki, we also have an aryl or vinyl boron compound. So you can see down here, this is our boron compound. We've got a boron that's connected to two OH groups. And over here, we've got this boron and it's connected to these O ethyl groups. Now you guys might be wondering uh, why there's a difference between the two of them. Uh, you'll, you'll end up seeing both of them. Sometimes you'll also see a boron connected to an oxygen with just a methyl group. Um, for the purposes of organic chemistry too, any of these boron compounds will act the same in a Suzuki reaction. Uh, the, the reason why they're slightly different is depending on the way that you synthesized your boron compound, um, you might have you know, e either one of these. You can see in this case, um, it's a very similar kind of coupling uh, reaction where you know you, we can imagine we kind of get rid of this and we get rid of this and we draw a new bond between this carbon and that carbon right there. 
And notice that this double bond is in the Z uh, conformation. It's the Z stereoisomer, and it remains that way after the reaction. So the Suzuki reaction kind of has some programmable stereochemistry. Um, if your halide is in the Z configuration to start, um, your product will have the Z configuration there. Um, and then you can see over here is just another example, but with a triflate this time. And you can see this one's really easy. We don't have to worry about stereochemistry because they're both achiral. We kind of just pretend those disappear and make a bond between those two carbons to give us a product that looks like that. The third and final coupling reaction that you're going to need to know is the Sagan-Ashera reaction. And you can see again we've got a palladium catalyst, but this one also has copper. And that's uh, what's going to really make the Sagan Ashera reaction reagents um, different than the other two we just looked at. And you can see that the reactants are also different. We still have that aryl or vinyl halide or triflate. That's the same, just like the previous two. But for the Sagan Ashera, we specifically also need a terminal alkyne. So remember, an alkyne is a triple bond. And if it's terminal, that means one of the ends of the triple bonds has to be connected to a hydrogen, not a carbon. So you can see in this example down here with a halide, um, basically you can just think about it as the bromine goes away and we're making a bond between this carbon and that carbon to give us something that looks like this. And over here with the triflate, same kind of deal. We can imagine the triflate goes away and we just make a bond between here and here to give us a product that looks like that. Personally, the Sagan Ashera is my favorite. I think it's the easiest. So here is our first practice question. Um, if you would like to attempt it yourself, feel free to pause the video, but I am going to go through and explain how I would arrive at the right answer right now. Um, if I look at these reactants, I see that we have an aryl bromide, right, an aryl halide, and we also have an alkene. And so immediately I would have to know that this is the Heck reaction. And we can see that looking at these uh, reagents used confirms that these are the same reagents that I had posted on that earlier slide. So we know that um, in the Heck reaction, I can get rid of the bromine and draw a new bond between here and here. And remember that the major product is going to be the one with the E stereochemical configuration. So let's see, in A, there's no double bond here, which remember this alkene is still going to be an alkene in the product, so I don't like A. B has the right number of carbons, and everything looks like it's attached correctly. However, this is the Z stereoisomer, so I don't like B. C, well, C looks pretty good. Um, you can see C is in the, it's the E stereoisomer, and we have the right number of carbons, so that's good. And then E and D are both wrong because the bromine gets lost in this reaction, so I don't like either of those. So the correct answer is C. Um, here is another example of the Heck reaction, and I'd like everyone to think about what the product is here. Uh, even if you think this question is really easy, um, maybe just try to draw out uh, what, what you think the product would be. Um, I would imagine that after what we just talked about on those slides, most people would assume that this would be our product here, right? Where we kind of just get rid of the OTF and create a new bond in between this carbon and that carbon. Well, it turns out that's not the case, right? We were thinking that the product would look like this. But if we look at the actual product, this double bond has kind of moved down here. Well, how did that happen? And uh, in order to figure that out, we have to remember a little bit about chairs from Organic Chemistry 1. Uh, so first off, uh, it's just good to remember that if you have something sticking off a ring like this going straight up, that's axial. And if you have something sticking off at an angle like that, this would be equatorial. Um, so I'll, I'll be using those terms a little bit here, right? So this hydrogen would be axial. This hydrogen right here would be equatorial. Well, uh, going back to that big cycle of the Heck reaction, right? This is a really important step going from here to here. This is the ligand D insertion step. And uh, here, I guess I can write that out. I'll just say D insertion. And in that ligand D insertion step, we're moving a hydrogen from the ligand 
to the metal, right? That's what makes it ligand deinsertion. Now, a really important um, phenomena that happens during the Heck reaction is this syn addition and syn elimination. What does that mean? Um, syn addition means that when the alkene becomes coordinated to the metal, um, this part right here, which used to be part of the triflate, is going to add on the same side as the palladium does. So you can see in this image, this part that came from the halide and the palladium are on the same side. So that's the syn addition. Syn elimination means that when this palladium leaves, pops off, it's going to take a hydrogen that has to be on the same side, right? Syn means same side. So when this palladium leaves, it's going to take this hydrogen in particular, and you can see that this hydrogen's right here, to reform that double bond. So using this concept, uh, here is another practice question regarding the Heck reaction. Um, if you'd like to try it yourself, uh, pause the video and go for it. Otherwise, I am going to explain it. Now, in order to figure out this question, we're going to need to draw this reactant as a chair. And so you can see this is the six-membered ring in the chair conformation. If this hydrogen is wedged, that means the hydrogen must be right here. Um, it would be in the equatorial position. And if the deuterium is dashed, it must be in that axial position right there. Now, during the Heck reaction, this palladium catalyst is going to coordinate with this six-membered ring right here, because this is the halide, so the iodine is going to leave and the palladium is going to be coordinated to that carbon right there. So I'm going to redraw out our chair, just like that, the hydrogen, the deuterium, and this double bond is going to become coordinated to the palladium and the palladium has a whole bunch of ligands, but the only one that we're super concerned with right now is that six-membered ring, like this. Now, in the next step, we have that really important syn addition, where the palladium complex and the six-membered ring are going to add onto the same side as this double bond. And so if I were to draw that out, it would look something like this, where the palladium is on the top side of the ring, right? And so is that six-membered ring right here. And we still have the hydrogen and the deuterium. Now this next step is that really important ligand deinsertion step where the palladium complex is going to leave and it's going to pull a hydrogen with it. But remember, it's really important that that hydrogen has to be on the same side as the palladium. So between this hydrogen, this deuterium, or this hydrogen, there's only one hydrogen that will leave and go to the palladium. And that is this one right here, because this hydrogen and this palladium are both on the top side of the ring, where this deuterium and this hydrogen are on the bottom. And so that's going to lead to the final product looking something like this, where the deuterium is right here, the new double bond is right there, and this six-membered ring is sticking off like that. And so if we look at the answer choices, um, that means that the answer to this question must be C right here. Because you can see that this would be wedged because the six-membered ring is going up, and the deuterium is what's left because the hydrogen is pulled. So the answer is C. So I think this is probably the most challenging concept out of all these organic metallic videos. Um, if you're a student at Stony Brook, I haven't seen a question like this on a test in a few years now. You'll see some of them on the old practice exams, but um, I guess don't be too worried about this. Don't waste too much of your time studying this whole sin elimination and sin addition. Um, in this video, I also wanted to go over the organocopper chemistry. Um, it's going to be pretty brief, but it's kind of related to a coupling reaction. Um, this is the overall template, and uh, I'll go through and describe it here. You take a Grignard reagent, and this Grignard reagent has to be a primary alkyl group. So you can see down here, this is a primary alkyl bromide. 
um, and by using lithium we can turn it into this primary alkyl Grignard reagent. We can then use this copper and iodine compound to make a lithium dialkyl cuprate. So what this does is it uses two equivalents of our Grignard reagent to make this compound right here that's a copper and then one of them on both sides. So you can see I've kind of drawn that out right here where there's the copper and then on both sides the copper is attached to that alkyl group we had in the beginning. And then we use a, another alkyl bromide. Um, this one has to be primary but it can also be aryl or vinyl. So R2 can be aryl or vinyl. This first R can't be. And you can see that gives us the product at the end here. So essentially we're taking this compound and this compound and coupling them together, right? Kind of getting rid of those BRs and making a new bond from here to right there. But it's terribly inefficient because you're losing half of your alkyl group when you do it. So uh, this isn't super popular anymore, but still good to go over in the video. So that will be all for coupling reactions.